Welcome back to the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast for the November 21st, 2022 issue. This is Season 3, Episode 6. Evidence-Based Hair is a podcast produced by the Donovan Hair Academy and highlights new research in the field of hair loss. We'll use our time together not only to talk about what's new, but we'll reflect carefully on how all this new information ties in with what we've come to learn in the past and to think carefully about where we're heading in the future as a hair loss community. I'll use various studies each week as a pivot point to discuss key diagnostic pearls, treatment tips, that hopefully allow us all to become better practitioners. This podcast was created for practitioners of various backgrounds, but regardless of whether you care for patients with hair loss or simply care about the topic of hair loss, this podcast will be of interest. This podcast was created for educational purposes and shouldn't be considered a substitute for medical advice. The third Monday of each month is dedicated to topics related to scarring alopecia, and today we'll review six studies in the field of scarring alopecia. We'll begin by studies looking at the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine, which you might know as Plaquenil, in the treatment of lichen planal pilaris. Various studies in the past have quoted anywhere from 60% of patients achieve pretty significant benefits to slightly less, slightly more. A new study gives us further clues in terms of how helpful hydroxychloroquine might be. Then we'll take a look at a very important topic relating to allergic contact dermatitis in patients with lichen planal pilaris. There's been several studies in the past which have suggested that Patients with lichen plano pilaris and the lichen plano pilaris variant, known as frontal fibrosing alopecia, may have a slightly higher chance of having allergic contact dermatitis to various ingredients in cosmetic products. This includes fragrance, preservatives, and other compounds as well. We'll take a look at a very nice study suggesting that patients with lichen plano pilaris and frontal fibrosing alopecia may have a higher risk of allergic contact dermatitis. And here the authors identified allergens to propolis, as well as fragrance, and some preservatives. And we'll take a look at this very important study. The signal that is emerging is that, yes, some patients with scarring alopecia have a higher rate of contact dermatitis. And so we have to have that on our radar as we evaluate patients. We'll take a look at a nice study looking at the use of low-dose oral minoxidil in treating lichen plano pilaris. A study from 2021 by Dr. Vano from Spain suggested that, yes, oral minoxidil is a useful option for some patients with lichen plano pilaris. Here we have another study of oral minoxidil in female patients with lichen plano pilaris. How helpful is it? Well, we'll take a look at this study. And then we'll take a look at a very interesting phenomenon called the Renbach phenomenon. A phenomenon whereby a scalp condition prevents another condition from developing. And here, a dermal melanocytic nevi, or a mole, what you and I might refer to as a mole, is preventing destruction of hairs in patients with frontal fibrosing alopecia. And we'll take a look at the Renbach phenomenon in two patients from a study from Germany. Then we'll take a look at erosive pustular dermatosis of the scalp, this scarring alopecia whereby patients develop pustules and erosions that can lead to scarring alopecia, usually occurs in patients 60, 70, and 80 years of age. A number of triggers exist for erosive pustular dermatosis, including infections. And here, an 88-year-old male patient developing erosive pustular dermatosis after shingles or herpes zoster. We'll take a look at that important study. And a nice study looking at the relationship between acne keloidalis nuci, or these firm papules usually on the neck, and gout, or this inflammatory joint disease due to monosodium urate crystals. Is there a relationship between acne keloidalis and gout? Well, there seems to be in this study. And we'll take a look at that study and these six studies in some general and specific detail. The references for all these studies 
are in the show notes that accompany this episode. And so our learning objectives for today are the following. I'd like you to be able to discuss the benefits of hydroxychloroquine and lichen plano pilaris. I'd like you to outline allergens that might be relevant to patients with lichen plano pilaris and frontal fibrosing alopecia. I'd like you to discuss the benefits of low-dose oral minoxidil in lichen plano pilaris. I'd like you to be able to describe the Renbach phenomenon. What is it? And how does it relate to frontal fibrosing alopecia? I'd like you to be able to describe three or four or five potential triggers for erosive pustular dermatosis of the scalp. We'll see that infections are one of them. And then I'd like you to be able to describe the relationship between acne chelidalis nuci and gout. These are some of our important learning objectives, and I'll of course help you through these as we go along with today's podcast episode. So let's begin then. Very nice study by Vastarella and colleagues in the Italian Journal of Dermatology and Venereology in June looked at the efficacy and safety of hydroxychloroquine in the management of lichen plano pilaris. Hydroxychloroquine has a number of generics nowadays, but one of the most popular brand names is Plaquenil. And I mention the trade name here because many of our listeners are familiar with Plaquenil and maybe less familiar with the word hydroxychloroquine. So the authors here set out to study in a retrospective manner the benefits of hydroxychloroquine and clobetazole in treating lichen plano pilaris. And they had this protocol whereby patients were put on standard doses of hydroxychloroquine and clobetazole twice weekly, and they wanted to see how well it worked. And so the retrospective study included 15 patients. 86% were female, 13% male. The mean age was 58 years. All patients were treated with 200 to 400 milligrams per day of hydroxychloroquine for a period of 16 weeks and hydroxychloroquine was combined with clobetazole in this study twice a week. The median time for treatment was 12 months. And so the authors wanted to look at how well hydroxychloroquine worked, and they defined three important parameters. One was a complete response to hydroxychloroquine, one was a partial response, and one was a treatment failure. So what did they mean by these? Well, a complete response was a patient that had no symptoms, no further hair loss, no ongoing disease activity like redness or scale. A partial response was a patient that had a clinical improvement, perhaps an improvement in redness or scale, but some degree of ongoing activity. And a treatment failure was a patient that had ongoing activity and ongoing loss of hair. So there were no adverse events reported in this study. Here are the key findings. 20% of patients had a complete response, 53% had a partial response, and 7% were stable during the study period, and 20% of patients were treatment failures. So overall, about 80% of patients were felt to have some kind of benefit of hydroxychloroquine although complete responders were present in 20%. So I really like this study. There is an ongoing effort in our field to find new treatments for lichen plano pilaris. And I think it's really important that we have a good understanding of how good our current treatments are before we abandon them. I think that... um, Some medications, like hydroxychloroquine, for example, like topical steroids, like steroid injections, have been around a long, long time, and some of these treatments do have side effects, but we know the side effects very well, and we know the chances of the side effects because they've been around 30 and 40 years. And I think studies of hydroxychloroquine are important for us to know about because Some of us are really afraid to use these treatments and we are more willing to use anything that's new provided it's not something that's old. 
I think it's really important we know what our treatments in the toolbox are and how well they work. And this study reminds us that maybe 80% of patients might have some kind of benefit. Complete responses in 20%, partial responses in 53%. These studies are challenging to do. First, this is a short study, short duration, 16 weeks. We know for sure if a treatment shuts off scarring alopecia after two or three years. Mrs. Smith, Mr. Jones, Mr. Davidson, do you think you look the same as three years ago? Yes, I sure do. Do your pictures look the same as three years ago? Oh, they sure do. Not a, not a hair has gone missing. Well, then the treatments worked. And sometimes we even see improvements. What's more difficult is figuring out after two months, three months, five months, if the treatment has worked. That's challenging. Sometimes we have patients whereby the redness improves and the scaling improves, and we think that we've had success, only to find that the patient has gone on to lose more hair. What's with that? Your scaling improved, your redness improved, your itching improved, we should be winning. Why did you go on to lose more hair? And so it's challenging sometimes to evaluate these studies. Sometimes we have patients whereby the itching improves, but the scalp stays red, stays red, 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 but the disease is shut off. They don't go on to lose any more hair. Why is the scalp so red when they don't lose any more hair? So we have these two different scenarios, one where it looks like it should be inflamed, but the disease is shut off. Other scenarios where it looks really quiet, but the disease progresses. So these studies are really challenging to do. And so when we have treatments evaluating how did it affect the redness, how did it affect the scale, how did it affect the shedding, those are really important. But one thing which is really the most important thing is did the patient actually stop losing hair? And not all studies are long enough to address these important issues. And so all the studies we have in the scarring alopecia literature are of limited duration, and so we have to keep that in mind all the time. Am I always convinced when a study suggests that we use this drug, drug A, disease shut off after two weeks, well, that's interesting, but I really want to know if the disease stayed shut off after two years. And in the medical community, in the research community, we don't really want to drag studies on to two years before we publish them. Most of the time, we publish them after 16 weeks, three week, three months, um, sometimes six months, sometimes a year. But we have to keep in mind some patients relapse. They're doing well, then they relapse. Um, some patients take six, eight, ten months before the disease becomes quiet with a treatment. Hydroxychloroquine is a great example of that. Is it possible for a patient to be not really responding to hydroxychloroquine after three months or four months? And then finally at month six, seven, eight, they kind of feel like it's kicking in and it's working. Absolutely. And so if you cut off your study at three months or four months, you're going to have a number of patients which don't seem to be responding, if, but if you had given them more time, they might have. So these are the, these are the inherent challenges of our, of our studies. So we always have to keep that in mind. But overall, in this study, about 80% had some kind of benefit for about 20% of patients. Clobetazole and hydroxychloroquine are enough. The disease is shut off. No other treatment is needed. You don't need to bring on board steroid injections. You don't need to bring on board low-dose naltrexone, tacrolimus, doxycycline, methotrexate, mycophenolate, apremolast. You've won. You've shut off the disease. So that's 20% of patients, but there's another group of patients that we probably need to bring something else on board to shut off the disease. And so what are the studies in the literature that look at hydroxychloroquine and LPP? Well, we have this study that I mentioned. We have another study from 2010 by Dr. Uh, Chang and colleagues from UCSF. This is Dr. Vera's Price's group from UCSF. 
And that is a very important study in JAD to know about from 2010. The authors looked at 40 patients with LPP and or FFA who were treated with hydroxychloroquine for up to 12 months. The authors found that by using hydroxychloroquine, there was a significant reduction in the lichen plano pilaris activity index. Signs and symptoms of the disease were shut off by hydroxychloroquine. At six months, about 69% of patients had a reduction in signs and symptoms, and by 12 months, 83% of patients had a reduction in signs and symptoms. Again, a nice example of how some patients don't respond at six months, but then after seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 months, respond. There's a group of patients that are going to be responding later. And so there are a lot of patients that we put on hydroxychloroquine, and we see them back in three months, and we say, hmm, it doesn't look like you're responding. Your redness isn't better. Your shedding isn't better. Your scaling isn't better. Let's stop. Let's put you on mm, mycophenolate. Or let's put you on a premolast, or let's put you on, you know, doxycycline, or let's put you on low-dose naltrexone. Well, sometimes with some of these drugs, we need longer before we see results, at least for some patients. And there's no doubt about it that we abandon treatment too early for some patients. So Chang and colleagues is important to know about. Don Chen colleagues is another study that's important to know about in dermatologic therapy in 2017, titled The Role of Hydroxychloroquine in the Treatment of Lichen Plano Pilaris, a Retrospective Case Series and Review. The title is great, tells us what it's about. So the authors evaluated 23 patients with LPP. 61% had a complete response in these authors' uh, publication, and 9% had a partial response. So these studies are challenging. It's challenging to know what the definitions are of complete responses. It's really important to look at the study duration. But anywhere from 50 to 60 to 80 percent of patients have some kind of benefit with hydroxychloroquine. And complete responses are anywhere from 20 to 50 to 60 percent. So we move on now to a very nice study published in the journal called Dermatitis by Steinberger, titled The Prevalence of Type 4 Hypersensitivity in Patients with Lichen Plano Pilaris and Frontal Fibrosing Alopecia. Type 4 hypersensitivity means allergic contact dermatitis, allergy in the skin from the products we apply, the shampoos, the conditioners, the lotions, the creams, the things we're applying to our skin. The concept of allergic contact dermatitis or allergy is really important in FFA and LPP. There's an emerging body of data, some of which I'll review with you today, suggesting that patients with LPP and FFA are quite likely to have an allergy. And so when anybody walks into the room, the clinic room, with lichen plano pilaris or FFA, you need to at least think about the possibility that that patient has a contact dermatitis to a product they're using. The cause of LPP and FFA is not known. It's, of course, a field of very active research, and some authors have proposed that allergens may have a role. We'll take a look at this study by Steinberger in just a minute, but let's back up and talk about a very nice study by Prasad and colleagues in 2020. There have been several studies uh, looking at contact allergens in LPP and FFA. The Prasad study is particularly nice because it looked at relevant allergens, then had patients try to remove those allergens from their life, and tried to see if patients' LPP and FFA got better. So let's take a look at that Prasad study. It's a study looking at patch test results, and patch testing is a technique where patients go into the clinic trying to find what allergens they could possibly be allergic to, if any. So patients go into clinic. These patches are taped on their back for many days. Patients can't get them wet. They can't shower. And then after three days, these patches are taken off, and the dermatologist 
sometimes the allergist, but usually patch testing is done by a dermatologist, sees if there's any redness that has developed. And then the patient is invited back again two days later and sometimes four days later to see if the skin has become red and scaly and even blistering at the site where the pure chemical was put on the back. And anywhere from 20 to 100 to 130 chemicals are put on the back to try to identify what allergens the patient could be allergic to. So the PRASAD study was an 18-month study um, of 42 patients that were referred to the author's clinic for patch testing. There was 62 patients, 62 percent of patients with LPP, 26 percent of patients had FFA, and 12 percent had FFA and LPP. If a positive allergen was found, patients were advised to try to avoid that allergen, and then the patients were invited back three months later to see if the scalp got better. So if you were found to be allergic to a preservative, then you were told to avoid that preservative in your shampoo, avoid that pre preservative in your conditioner, in your hairspray, in your hair gel, and come on back and we'll see if your LPP gets better. And so the most common allergens in the Prasad study were gallates, which are preservatives. In, it's a wonderful preservative in many topical products. Linalool, which is a fragrance, and fragrance mixes. 26% of patients had allergy to gallates, 19% to linalool, and 19% of patients had allergy to fragrance mixes. And overall, the authors of the Prasad study found that, gee, those proportions of allergy to fragrance mix and preservatives like MCI-MI were higher than expected in the general population. And so the authors proposed that maybe allergic contact dermatitis and this whole discussion of allergies is relevant in a patient with FFA and LPP. And 20, 20 patients decided that they were going to participate in a follow-up evaluation whereby they were going to go home and try to avoid using various products that had the allergens that they were told they were allergic to. And then three months later, they agreed to come back to clinic. And so of these 20 patients that changed their life by avoiding these allergens, 58% had decreased scalp itching. 72% had decreased scalp redness. So a really wonderful study suggesting that just maybe contact dermatitis is relevant to a patient with FFA and LPP. And just maybe by doing all this hard work to avoid the allergen, using new shampoos, using new conditioners, using new hairsprays, using new hair gels, telling your hairstylist, don't shampoo my hair in that shampoo, I'm allergic to MCIMI, or uh, telling your partner, don't buy this product from the store, I'm allergic to fragrances. For some people, these are big life changes, but in 50 to 70% of patients, it seemed to pay off. We now have a second wonderful study with very similar design by Steinberger and colleagues published in Dermatitis. The authors here set out to investigate patients with LPP and FFA to see if they have relevant allergens and to see again if their scalp could improve with allergen avoidance. Very similar design to the Prasad study. So Steinberger and colleagues published this retrospective study of 12 patients who had FFA or LPP, and they compared the data to 30 age-matched patients. So a little bit different design, a retrospective study with a control, which is a very nice design when we try to introduce controls to get a better sense if the data that we're seeing is really uh, coincidental or likely to be a, a true difference. And they compared patients that had dermatitis. So one group had LPP and FFA and one group had dermatitis. And all patients had patch testing performed over the June 2020 period to February 2022 period. So nine patients had LPP, three had FFA. They compared the results to 30 patients with scalp dermatitis. 
And look at this. All 12 patients with FFA or LPP had an allergen identified when patch testing with, was done. And in all of those 12 patients, that allergen that came up, that red scaly bump on the back, was felt to be clinically relevant. So it wasn't just an allergen that appeared on the back. Uh, you know, you're allergic to product X. What's product X? I've never heard of it. I've, I've never, I don't do that in my hobbies or my occupation or the things that I do. It makes no sense. These 12 patients with LPP and FFA had allergens that seemed relevant. Compared to patients with scalp dermatitis, where only 63% of patients had a relevant allergen. And so it was felt that patients with LPP and FFA were more likely to have a relevant allergen. What was the most common allergen? Well, in both the scarring alopecia group and the dermatitis group, it was propolis. A positive patch test to propolis occurred in 50% of patients with scarring alopecia and 20% of those with dermatitis. The other relevant allergens included fragrance mix in two patients, 16%, MI in one patient, 8%, and iodopropinyl butylcarbamate in one patient, which is 8%. And so again, preservatives, fragrance, propolis being the relevant allergens in uh, patients with FFA and LPP. We know from the Prasad study that avoiding allergens seem to help. What about in this study? Well, in the Steinberger study, nine patients went about trying to avoid the allergens that they were told. And six of those nine patients had improvement. Four had decreased redness or scaling. Two had an improvement in scalp pain or itching. Two had an improved hair density or were stable. And one had decreased shedding. The authors pointed out that even though six patients had improvement, some of those patients also had slight modifications in their treatment plan. So it could have been the modifications in the treatment plan. But there were two patients by which the only thing they did was avoid the allergen that they were told, and they had an improvement. Again, some evidence that allergen avoidance is indeed a very valid treatment uh, strategy for some patients. So this is another study looking at the role of allergens in FFA and LPP, and we now have three or four of these good studies that are suggesting that, yes, it's relevant to be thinking about allergens in patients with LPP and FFA. Yes, it is relevant to ask patients, what shampoos do you use? What conditioners do you use? What hair dyes do you use? What hairsprays do you use? What gels do you use? What touches your skin? This is the first study to include an age-matched comparative group in their study design. And we don't yet know what role these allergens play, but this data that's accumulating really can't be ignored. It's a small study which limits the generalizability of the conclusions. The challenge with these patch testing studies is they're a bit all over the place. Here we have propolis as one of the most common allergens. Fragrance mix has been a common allergen. Fragrance products have been a common allergen. We have preservatives like MCIMI being common allergens. Other studies have suggested different groups of allergens. And so it's not really clear what allergens are important. Do patients in North America have different allergens and patients in Europe? It's really hard to know. And this study suggested that 100% of patients with FFA and LPP have an allergen that's relevant. Well, I can tell you in my clinic it's not 100%. We, we send lots of patients off for patch testing. Sometimes a relevant allergen does come back. But many times my colleague, my patch testing expert, says to me, Jeff, I did the patch testing. There was no allergens. We did 80 or 90 different allergens. Zero. 
and the patient comes back and says, I thought I was going to be allergic to something in my shampoo. I, I, I swore I was going to be allergic. Zero. Next patient comes back, zero. And then your feeling is, should I be sending these patients for patch testing? I feel like I'm wasting their time, my time, my colleagues' time. I feel I should. There's all this data suggesting that allergens are relevant in FFA and LPP. So the next patient you see, you think, I'm going to send the patient for batch testing. I think there could be an allergen here. And voila, it comes back showing they have an allergen. And then you're back on board feeling that, yes, I'm, I'm going to send the next patients for patch testing. And then the next patient comes back negative again. So in my group of patients, not everybody comes back positive for these allergens. But I think it's an area that's very relevant. And I think that it's not unreasonable to be thinking about sending your patients with LPP and FFA for patch testing. I think we need to study this more. I think we need to share data and cooperate in this area. One of the challenges that I have is that many of the patients that I send for patch testing in the hair clinic, no matter what medical hair loss condition they have, I'm more likely to send a patient for patch testing if they have a rash on one of the fence areas, or what I call the fence areas, F-E-N-C-E, -E, which stands for face and forehead, eyelids, neck, chest, and ears, F-E-N-C-E. -E. So if we have a patient that comes in with a red scalp, and the patient says, do you think I'm allergic to something? I will ask, do you, do you get any rashes on the face or forehead? No. Do you get any rashes on the eyelids? No. Do you get any rashes on the neck? No. What about the chest? No. What about the ears? No. Well, if the answer to all five of those is no, generally speaking, I feel that the chances of allergic contact dermatitis or a positive patch testing result is pretty low. What patients with FFA and LPP are teaching me is that even if those five answers are no, some patients still have positive allergens and relevant allergens. And so we can't just use the fence criteria as the uh, decision maker on whether I send them to my patch testing expert. So who should we be patch testing? I don't think we know. I think there are some colleagues that feel Everybody should be patch tested with LPP and FFA. If you have LPP and FFA, you leave with a treatment plan, you leave with blood test requisitions, and you leave with a referral to the patch testing clinic. There are other colleagues that believe, well, no, we don't send everyone off for patch testing. We make good clinical judgment. We listen to the story. Do you have rashes on the face, on the ears, on the forehead, on the neck, on the back? What are, you, what are your shampoos? Bring in your shampoo bottles. Bring in your conditioner. Bring in your this. Bring in your that. Let's see if it makes sense. I'm not sending you to the patch testing clinic unless it makes sense. So I don't think we know these answers. I don't think we know yet who we should be patch testing. I think right now, the field is in its infancy. It's not unreasonable to be thinking about patch testing many patients with FFA and LPP. But... It's equally reasonable in the infancy stage to say, it just doesn't make sense to send my patient for patch testing. So we need more studies in this area. But if you don't send patients for patch testing, I think it is uh, a very realistic treatment plan to include hypoallergenic products. And so sometimes I say to my patients, I don't think you have an allergen. Your story doesn't make sense that you'd have an allergen. Um, let's see how you do. And if you fail to respond to treatment, maybe we'll patch test you. Sometimes we try hypoallergenic shampoos, and there's a number of shampoos on the market which are devoid of fragrance, devoid of preservatives, devoid of surfactants. And sometimes it's reasonable to try these to see if by trying them, the patient has an improvement in their LPP and FFA, and sometimes they do. And so if you say to your patient, for the next four months or six months, I only want you to use this shampoo, I'd like you to try to avoid, uh, you know, these hairsprays or these products if you can. Uh, 
and let's see the effect of it. If it's a dramatic effect, then you can say to your patch testing colleague, would you please see my patient for consideration of patch testing? I really wasn't sure if a contact allergen is relevant, but there's this emerging body of data about LPP and FFA suggesting some patients have contact allergens. I put the patient on a hypoallergenic shampoo and he or she has done remarkably better. Do you think there's an allergen? And I advise patients, please stick with these hypoallergenic products. When you go on holidays and you go into the hotel room and you see these wonderful baskets with shampoos and conditioners, leave them in the wonderful basket because those wonderful products in the hotel room are fragranced beyond belief often and have preservatives often which allow them to smell nice and they have wonderful surfactants in them which lather up lovely and we really like them but maybe they cause allergens allergy so in this study propolis was a common allergen what is propolis well it's a substance derived from beeswax and also some trees like poplar trees and conifer trees propolis is used in a lot of products Many checkout counters that I go up to in various stores, you see lip balms with propolis in them. You see cosmetic products with propolis in them. It's in cosmetics. It's in ointments. It's in cough syrups, hair products, lipsticks, facial creams, mouthwashes, toothpastes, gums. It's in vitamins. It's in honey. It's in the varnishes on violins. So there's lots of products that have propolis. According to the North American Contact Research Group, about 1.6 to 6% of patients undergoing routine patch testing have an allergy to propolis, or at least a positive patch test to propolis. And the rates of propolis allergy are increasing in the world, in children, in adults, in Europe, in North America, around the world. So, fascinating study of allergens in FFA and LPP. Remember, to at least consider that subject when you're seeing patients. If you're not sure what to do, by default, it's probably not unreasonable to send some patients if the thresh, if you feel there's a chance off to your patch testing colleagues. Let's move on now to a nice study looking at oral minoxidil in lichen plano pilaris. The second study of oral minoxidil in lichen plano pilaris a study by Gallo and colleagues. Low-dose oral minoxidil is being studied in many hair loss conditions, androgenetic hair loss, chronic telogen effluvium, alopecia areata, and scarring alopecia. Low-dose oral minoxidil refers to doses anywhere from 0.25 milligrams up to 5 milligrams. Dr. Vano from Spain published a very nice study last year looking at oral minoxidil in LPP. That was published in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology. And I'd like to remind you about that study before we move on to the Gallo study. And Dr. Vanyo's study looked at the effectiveness of oral minoxidil in 51 patients with LPP, 70% women, 30% men, Males had a mean median dose of 2.7 milligrams. Females had a median dose of 0.75 milligrams. Do keep in mind that males generally use a higher dose of oral minoxidil than females. The mean duration of therapy was 21 months. Here's the key point of Dr. Vanyo's study. 39% improved in their hair thickness. About half were stable and 8% were worse. So a suggestion here that adding oral minoxidil to patients with LPP can help some patients. So now we move on to Gallo's study. This was a study of 12 female patients with lichen plano pilaris. The average dose of oral minoxidil was 0.5 milligrams taken at night. After three months of therapy, the authors felt there was an improvement and further improvements occurred as the study went on to month 6 and 12. None of the 12 patients stopped treatment. There were no serious adverse events, but two patients, 16.7%, had mild hypertrichosis or increased hair growth, but that didn't prompt them to stop minoxidil. 
So another study of oral minoxidil use for LPP. What we don't know here uh, is what proportion of patients had androgenetic alopecia mixed in with the LPP. Remember, when you see patients with LPP, a very high percentage of them have androgenetic hair loss. Same is true with frontal fibrosing alopecia. Androgenetic hair loss is common in the population. And so lots of patients with LPP have androgenetic alopecia. Lots of patients 50 years of age and over with any condition have androgenetic alopecia. Half of people 50 years of age and over at a social gathering have androgenetic hair loss. It's a common condition. So we don't here know what proportion of patients had androgenetic alopecia. We also don't know how active the LPP was in this study and what medications they were using now or in the past. And I think this is really important. If we're going to really understand how to use oral minoxidil, it's important to understand what the background of androgenetic hair loss is and how active the LPP is. If a patient has LPP and no androgenetic hair loss, should we be using oral minoxidil? Maybe, maybe not. If a patient has LPP and has androgenetic hair loss, maybe the hair improvement is more likely. If a patient has LPP and has extremely active LPP, intense burning, intense pain, intense scaling, intense shedding, should you be adding oral minoxidil to the plan? We don't know. My personal view is probably not that what I like to do in scarring alopecia is first get everything quiet, quiet, quiet before I do anything at all that could cause shedding. And so if I have a patient with active, active LPP and I'm, I'm using topical steroids, steroid injections, hydroxychloroquine, whatever I'm using, what I want to do first is get the disease under control. I want to shut off the shedding, shut off the redness, shut off the scaling, shut off the itching, burning, and pain. If I add oral minoxidil on day one and the patient calls me two weeks or four weeks later and says, I'm shedding a lot, I won't know if you're shedding from the oral minoxidil or you're shedding from the disease being active. There's no right or wrong answer. Personally, my own view is that I want to quiet down the disease before I do anything that's going to cause more shedding. So I like to treat LPP, FFA, any scarring alopecia aggressively, get it quiet. And once it's quiet, then I say to the little hair follicles, now it's safe for you to grow. We've reduced all the inflammation around you. It's a safe environment for you to grow. I'm giving you minoxidil, I'm giving you laser, I'm giving you PRP. Now is the time for you to grow. So personally, I like to induce uh, growth and stimulate growth after I've done the best job I can to shut off the disease. Now, there's no right or wrong answer in this. It's a professional opinion, a personal opinion, but I like to use oral minoxidil after I've quieted down the disease. So in these studies, it's really important to know how patients are using oral minoxidil, how the study investigators are using oral minoxidil. Are they using it in quiet LPP? Are they using it in active LPP? Are they using it in patients with no androgenetic hair loss? Are they using it in patients with androgenetic hair loss? Is the oral minoxidil encouraging hairs that are sick under the scalp to pop back up? Is it encouraging miniaturized hairs as part of androgenetic hair loss to get thicker? What is the effect? I think we need these studies and I don't think we know. We move on now to a very interesting phenomenon called the Renbach phenomenon, a study by Slowinska and colleagues in the Journal of the European Academy of Dermatology and Venereology in the December issue. So the authors here from Germany present an interesting report of two patients with FFA who developed very typical FFA in the frontal hairline, except the FFA did not attack 
an area with a dermal melanocytic nevus. So there was hair growing out of a dermal melanocytic nevus or a mole. And those hairs were spared from the scarring alopecia. So what is the Renbach phenomenon? Well, the Renbach phenomenon is a special situation whereby a certain skin condition prevents another one from occurring. And the R-E-N-B-O-K is the reverse spelling of Kebner, K-O-B-N-E-R. And the Kebner phenomenon is a situation where one skin condition encourages another skin condition to develop. You injure the skin, you get psoriasis. You injure the skin, you get lichen planus. That's the Kebner phenomenon. The Renbach phenomenon, or the opposite spelling, is where a skin condition prevents another from developing. So the authors here propose that two patients had Renbach phenomenon, whereby they had this mole, a dermal melanocytic nevus, and the dermal melanocytic nevus had hair growing out of it, and by virtue of being a, dermato a dermal melanocytic nevus, it blocked the scarring alopecia process from occurring. Now, why was this so interesting to the researchers? Well, we know that melanocytes have something to do with FFA because they're reduced in FFA. There's been several good studies, including a recent study in the American Journal of Dermatopathology by Salas Callow and colleagues, showing that melanocytes are reduced. Whether they truly play a role in the disease or not is not clear. Whether they're just reduced because of a secondary effect, they're just bystanders in all this inflammation, or whether the reduction in melanocytes really plays a role, we don't understand. But it's interesting that melanocytes are reduced in FFA, and here we have a melanocytic nevus, a mole on the scalp, and it blocks the development of FFA. How do we use this information? Well, we don't know. But it certainly is interesting because there's some signaling going on there, perhaps, in the skin that's blocking FFA. If we can understand the pathway, the mechanism by which the FFA is blocked and these hairs survive in the mole, then perhaps we can develop new treatments for FFA. We move on to a, a nice study by Sala and colleagues, published in the Journal of Cosmetic Dermatology in November, titled Erosive pustular dermatosis of the scalp in the COVID-19 era. So erosive pustular dermatosis is an inflammatory condition that can lead to scarring alopecia. Patients present with erosions and crusts and pus. And when you first see a patient with erosive pustular dermatosis of the scalp, you think that they have an infection. You press on the scalp, it's boggy. You press over here on the left and over here on the right, pus comes out and you take off the crust, and it, it, it oozes some of this pus, and it's red, it's very friable tissue. And so your feeling is that this must be some kind of infection, bacterial infection or fungal infection or something. And the lesions can progress to scarring alopecia. You swab it, comes back negative. You biopsy it, your pathologist says, it's nothing really classic, it's some kind of an erosive inflammatory condition. We don't know what causes erosive pustular dermatosis of the scalp, but we do know it's a condition that occurs in slightly older individuals usually. And several things can trigger it, including infections, especially herpes zoster, trauma, inflammation, topical therapies, medications, even the medications we use to treat skin cancers like amiquimod can, can trigger erosive pustular dermatosis of the scalp. So lots of different triggers. The diagnostic criteria that have been set forth include skin that's atrophic or an actinic damaged skin. There's erosions, pustules, or scales, and crusting. No specific histopathology. No infectious agent is found when you swab it or send it for culture. You've ruled out mimicking conditions. You've ruled out blistering skin conditions of various pemphigus issues. You've ruled out tinea. You've ruled out deep fungal infections. It has a chronic course leading to scarring alopecia. 
and it has a prompt, rapid, surprising response to topical steroids. You see a patient with all these erosions and crusts and scale, you give them clobetazole, you tell them to use it twice daily, a large, large proportion of patients come back in one month with those erosions and crusting gone and the scalp healed. You can use tacrolimus. There's been numerous studies in the literature on other things, topical dapsone, oral dapsone, and other treatments as well. But the reality is, is that your starting agent for most patients is topical clobetazole, and it works wonders in a large, large proportion of patients with erosive pustular dermatosis. And if it doesn't, you need to question the diagnosis. So here we have a patient, 88 years of age, who presents with erosive pustular dermatosis of the scalp shortly after his first episode of a herpes zoster infection, or shingles. The lesions slowly progress to involve other areas of the scalp. And the authors inform us that the erosive pustular dermatosis of the scalp happened after the shingles, but the shingles happened after the patient received the COVID-19 Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And we'll come back to why this is relevant. The patient underwent lab tests and they were normal. Bacterial and fungal cultures were negative. Skin biopsy showed really a nonspecific finding, but there was focal ulcerations, erosions, and a perivascular inflammatory infiltrate uh, of neutrophils. Perivascular and perifollicular inflammatory infiltrate of neutrophils. The diagnosis was thought to be erosive pustular dermatosis of the scalp. The patient was put on clobetazole cream twice daily. After four weeks, the patches of erosions and pustules resolved, and what was left behind was a scarring alopecia. Very typical course of what we expect in erosive pustular dermatosis of the scalp. So another nice example of infections being the trigger for erosive pustular dermatosis of the scalp. Here, herpes zoster or shingles thought to be the trigger. And infections are one of those five categories that I spoke about. And in the infectious category, certainly herpes zoster is a, a known trigger of erosive pustular dermatosis of the scalp. And the authors proposed that their case is the fifth case of erosive pustular dermatosis of the scalp published in the literature due to herpes zoster. So finally, let me point out another really important fact here, and the authors title their article, Erosive Pustular Dermatosis of the Scalp in the COVID Era, because they wonder whether the COVID vaccine might have triggered the herpes zoster, and the herpes zoster then triggered the erosive pustular dermatosis of the scalp. Not a bad thought. There's been tremendous discussion in the medical community in social media, in the public, that the COVID vaccines are increasing the risk of shingles. Well, a very nice study, large study, 2 million people, published in JAMA Network, open in November, puts to rest the wondering, because the study shows that COVID vaccines do not increase the risk of shingles. So this was a study of 2 million patients, and it's an important study because there has been all this concern that COVID vaccines could cause shingles. What we need to remember is that one in three people will get shingles in their lifetime, and most of these people are over 65. And about a million people each year in the U.S. alone get shingles. What's the most common age group to get COVID vaccines? People over 65. What's the most common age group to get shingles? People over 65. There's going to be a whole lot of people out there that are over 65 getting shingles and a whole lot of people out there over 65 that are going out to get a COVID vaccine. And so there's going to be a whole lot of people over 65 that say, hey, I just got shingles, and you know what? I had a COVID vaccine just a few weeks ago. 
And so this study was really needed. It was a well-designed well study. It was needed to put to rest this thought. And perhaps the authors would have found a different result, but they didn't. They found that there was no relationship between COVID vaccines and shingles. And so the authors of this study are indeed correct to think that there could be a relationship because that was a thought. But this nice study in JAMA Network Open puts to rest that thought that there doesn't seem to be a, re a relationship between COVID mRNA vaccines and the development of shingles. But you're going to have patients that say, I got shingles, I had a vaccine a few weeks ago. Absolutely. Because shingles is extremely, extremely common. And COVID vaccines are extremely, extremely commonly administered, especially in patients over 65. So here, a nice study reminding us of the infectious triggers of erosive pustular dermatosis, herpes zoster being one of the more common infectious triggers, and a nice study reminding us that we have a lot of fancy treatments for erosive pustular dermatosis of the scalp, but clobetazole is a first-line treatment, and the majority of your patients will respond to twice-daily clobetazole for four to six weeks. And if they don't, you certainly need to question the diagnosis. You certainly need to question whether perhaps you've missed a bacterial infection. Perhaps you've missed a fungal infection. Perhaps you've missed a blistering disease. Perhaps you've missed another autoimmune condition mimicking uh, erosive pustular dermatosis of the scalp. And finally, a nice study looking at the relationship between acne keloid alis nuci and gout. We certainly don't talk a lot about gout in the hair clinic. So a wonderful opportunity for us to talk about gout, this joint disease that's really quite common in the population. So acne keloid alis nuci are these bumps that develop on the, the neck, usually. Um, firm, inflammatory, itchy papules that can progress to cause permanent hair loss. Sometimes they are small little bumps growing in between hair. Other times they are very, very large nodular lesions that uh, destroy hair in the pathway and can lead to quite disfiguring changes in the neckline. So the authors here performed a very nice retrospective study of acne keloid alis nuci compared to controls, looking at whether there's a relationship between acne keloid alis nuci and gout. They evaluated 2,677 patients with acne keloid alis nuci and compared data to 13,190 age, sex, and ethnicity matched controls. And the incidence of new onset gout was compared between the two groups. So before we get into the data, what is gout? How common is it? Well, gout is this joint disease caused by the deposition of these monosodium urate crystals in joints and tissues. 3 to 6% of men, 1 to 3% of women in the Western world have gout. There are many risks to develop gout. There are comorbidities like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, the use of diuretics, elevated cholesterol and triglycerides, hyperuricemia, high uric acid, obesity, menopause, kidney disease, these all increase the risk of gout. Certain demographic factors, like being Taiwanese, being of Pacific Island background, the Maori group from New Zealand, living in high-income countries, being of male sex, is a risk factor for gout. And it's well known that dietary factors, especially diets rich in meat and seafoods, are risk factors for gout. Alcohol consumption, beer more than wine, fructose-rich foods and soft drinks are risk factors for gout. A patient with gout develops redness, pain, swelling in a joint. The first MTP joint of the big toe is a common site of gout. And listeners are probably well aware of stories of people with gout who say, I couldn't even put my bed sheet over my big toe. It was just so painful. That's gout. If it's red, acutely painful, uh, that's gout. And 
gout of the first MTP joint of the toe is often called pedagra. But some patients, some patients have tophi, or this chalk-like substance draining from uh, the ear, the olecranon bursa. But the diagnosis of gout is more than just a sore joint in someone that has high uric acid. There are several criteria that have been put forth, and there are many validated scoring systems where you can go online and, and ask patients certain questions and punch it into the calculator and figure out their chances of gout. And so a very nice online calculator by Dr. Janssen's and colleagues um, allows you to go online and you just type in Janssen's scoring system. Is the patient male, yes or no? Do they have a previous arthritis attack, yes or no? Is this particular onset within a day? Is the joint red? Is it the first MTP joint? Do they have a history of hypertension? Is the uric acid level over 5.8 milligrams per deciliter or 0.35 millimoles per liter? You answer all those questions and you click enter and it gives you a calculator. It says, in this case, the patient has an 82% chance of gout. And so you can use these online calculators to help you determine whether your patient has gout. A patient can have gout with, um, without going and trying to drain the joint to see if you get these monosodium urate crystals, if the suspicion is high enough. Um, and so these online calculators are really ha helpful. In this particular study, the rate of new onset gout was higher in patients with acne keloidalis nuci compared to controls. It was 1.12 per 1,000 patient years in acne keloidalis nuci and 0.48 per 100 person years in patients that were controls. After controlling for age, sex, ethnicity, acne keloidalis was felt to be an independent risk factor for gout with a 2.3 fold increased risk. But when they went back and adjusted for body mass index, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, the risk of acne keloidalis, the risk of gout in acne keloidalis was no longer significant. And so what that means is that patients with acne keloidalis nuci are probably at increased risk for gout, but it's probably their risk factors. They're more likely to have higher body mass. They're more likely to have diabetes, more likely to have hypertension, more likely to have high cholesterol than the average person in the population. And it's these risk factors in patients with acne keloidalis nuci that are increasing their risk for gout. And so the authors here propose that we should be screening for gout if the history suggests. You see a patient with acne keloidalis nuci and they say they have sore toe or they have sore joints of the fingers or the ankle or midfoot, other common sites for, for gout or they have these chalk-like drainings from the ear or the olecranon bursa. So if the history suggests this could be gout, then it makes sense to screen for gout in your patients with acne keloidalis nuci. Now remember that family practitioners and rheumatologists are, you know, the premier experts in managing gout. If I have a patient that I suspect is uh, going to have gout, I may order uric acid levels before I refer them to the family practitioner or the rheumatologist. But um, the, the physician that's going to manage the lowering of the uric acid levels, if that's appropriate, is the family practitioner or the rheumatologist. If a patient has an acute episode of gout, there are treatments like NSAIDs and corticosteroids that are used to, to manage that acute episode. If a patient has recurrent episodes, then you need treatments that lower uric acid levels like allopurinol and other treatments. And generally speaking, the family practitioner, the general practitioner, the internist, the rheumatologist is going to manage that patient. Um, and so we hope that the patient can be seen quickly. This is extremely painful. A first episode or recurrent episode of gout is extremely, extremely painful. And many of these patients are seen in the emergency room uh, as well. So that's it for this week. I'd like to thank you very much for joining me for this episode relating to scarring alopecia. 
We talked about six wonderful studies. We talked about hydroxychloroquine and LPP. How good is it? Well, it seems in this study, 20% had complete responses, 50% had partial responses, and overall, about 80% have some kind of benefit from using hydroxychloroquine. Don't forget to remember what's in the toolbox. We need to explore new therapies as well, but don't forget all the good stuff that's in the toolbox. We talked about allergic contact dermatitis and LPP and FFA. A really nice study reminding us that allergens may be relevant to LPP and FFA. Here, propolis was a common allergen. Uh, well, it was an allergen in, in these 12 patients. Fragrance was an allergen. Preservatives were allergens. And all of these 12 patients in this study had relevant allergens. And some patients went on to avoid their allergen and they improved. So a very nice study which complements the Prasad study. And I think this is really important for us to know about. You need to make the decision, if you're a practitioner, am I going to refer my patient for patch testing with LPP and FFA? And there's no right answer, but I think right now you should probably have a pretty low threshold for doing so. I think this is exciting. I think there's a whole group of people that are chasing the sunscreen issue. Are sunscreens involved in LPP and FFA? And if it is, are you a believer that it's the titanium dioxide? The So there's a sunscreen group. And here's this allergen group. Are these allergens relevant to FFA and LPP? Uh, pretty exciting data. And I think that it's a area that we need to explore further. Oral minoxidil is helpful for LPP. I think we need to design better studies to understand exactly who it's useful for and exactly what is the mechanism by which it works. Should we be using it, oral minoxidil in patients with rip-roaring, flaring LPP who come in with ice packs on their scalp and can't sleep? Or should we be reserving it for patients that have finally stabilized their LPP and are looking to cheer on hairs to grow back? There's no right or wrong answer yet. We talked about this fascinating Renbach phenomenon in FFA, the Renbach phenomenon is a phenomenon whereby a certain scalp condition blocks another scalp condition from happening. And here, these dermal melanocytic nevi, these moles, and moles are super common in the population, these dermal melanocytic nevi block the development of FFA in hairs that were coming out of the mole. We talked about many triggers for erosive pustular dermatosis of the scalp. Here, herpes zoster, shingles, as a trigger for erosive pustular dermatosis. And we talked about an interesting relationship between acne keloidalis nuci and gout, and discussed that our patients with acne keloidalis nuci probably have an increased risk for gout. And the reason they probably have an increased risk for gout is because they probably have a higher chance of hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, some of these risk factors that we know contribute to gout. I look forward to welcoming you back next week. Next week will be the fourth Monday of the month of November, and that's where we talk about a potpourri of different studies published in the last few months. And I look forward to welcoming you right back here on the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast.